All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the CPVC seminar in person edition. So, today we have uh, Alex Sushkov, who's visiting from Boston University. So, Alex, I think a few people who may know Alex, Alex is an experimentalist working on some very exciting um, experiments probing axions and fundamental physics using um, the spins. Um, and I hear we're going to hear a nice technical talk about experiment called Casper today. So thank you for uh, coming and giving us a seminar and I'll uh, leave it in your hands. Thank you, Kieran. Thanks everyone for showing up uh, on a Sunday, Monday, sunny Monday afternoon. Uh, let's see, and you are being, I am being recorded. So that's fine. Okay, so, um, so yeah, thanks again. And I hear this is a journal club, so I, I'm not gonna present a paper or maybe I will present kind of a couple of papers, but uh, please interrupt, make, let's make this informal. Um, Mostly, any experimentalists in the audience? A couple, excellent. All right, so theory questions are allowed, but you know, keep, keep, keep it gentle on me. Uh, okay, so what I wanted to talk about today is mostly, uh, well, my title is uh, Quantum Limits of Precision Magnetic Resonance. And so what that means, I wanna ask a question. As an experimentalist, I'm interested in building experiments, so I wanna ask, what is the most sensitive experiment I can possibly build that doesn't violate laws of nature, basically. That's what this talk will be about, and specifically talking about magnetic resonance, right? So um, again, this will be informal and a little more technical, uh, but, but here is a summary of the main points I wanted to make. Uh, so I will focus, I, you know, I'll talk about magnetic resonance, but I'll obviously focus on a very specific science target, which is um, searching for this QCD axiom in dark matter, uh, and one of the points I wanted to make is that this is a really broadband approach. This, this experimental approach uh, can actually make the search in a very wide mass range. Uh, and a key benchmark, a key goal is to uh, reach the sensitivity of this experiment that's actually limited by quantum spin projection noise. This is this, is this fundamental sensitivity limit um, uh, that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago. That's, that's where we want to get. Uh, and the the... The, the point I'll make is actually we have demonstrated our sensitivity benchmarks that, that, that corresponds to this sensitivity. So, so I'll talk about exactly what that means. Um, these, are, these are the main things I wanted to talk about today. So, uh, right, I'm not gonna have any introduction to axions of dark matter uh, because probably everyone here knows a lot more about this than I do. Um, so I'll just kind of put this up there. Uh, and, and, and again, just for, for setting the context, uh, I'll mention that, of course, uh, there's very well-motivated particle-like dark matter, such as the WIMPs, um, but I won't talk about them. I will focus more on this kind of wave-like, axion-like dark matter, which is much, much lighter. So don't think of it as particle, think of it as waves. Uh, and so, uh, again, I, this is kind of my standard introduction slide. So, so if axions uh, do indeed exist and make up the majority of dark matter, the major part of dark matter, then, then you can think of it to a good approximation, uh, the axion like dark matter field as some kind of a constant times cosine omega t, where omega is the Compton frequency of the axion. Uh, and this constant is, uh, the square of this constant is proportional to the dark matter energy density, uh, which is about 0.4 giga electron volts per centimeter. So this is this um, kind of wavy thing that I'm, uh, uh, the GIF over here is meant to represent. Um, and the great thing about axions is that, uh, well, they're, they're kind of, uh, they, they solve a strong CP problem. Uh, they're well uh, studied dark matter candidates. Uh, and they have, they, they kind of have, they can have three um, possible interactions with standard model particles, which is how we would search for them. And the first one, this is the defining QCD axion interaction is the interaction with the gluon field G mu nu over here. Um, this is the diagram an axion uh, talking to two gluons. And as an experimentalist, that doesn't, this doesn't um, say much, this is not of much use to me. What's more useful is a Hamiltonian that I can then use to make, to build some experiment, to make some measurements. So this is a, a corresponding Hamiltonian uh, of, a, of some kind of a neutron or a nuclear spin I interacting with axion-like field A, uh, with, where GD is the uh, coupling constant and E star is the effective electric field that I'll talk about in a few minutes. So this basically looks, this interaction looks like an electric dipole moment. 
uh, right? So, and, and again, this is maybe in the context of the strong CP problem, this shouldn't be surprising, right? This, this interaction gives rise uh, to an oscillating electric dipole moment, um, which is just GD times uh, uh, A of a neutron. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of experiments that look for this. Um, uh, there's a th there's a second interaction which is the X, uh, gradient interaction with fermion spin. Uh, so if you take any fermion, uh, then the gradient of the axion-like field uh, couples to the fermion spin over here. This could be nuclear spin, could be electron spin, and so on. There's a few experiments that look for this, um, and together, actually, Casper, the cosmic axion spin precession experiments, they look for these two. They search for these two interactions. But that's, these are actually not the interactions that most experiments search for. Of course, as everybody here knows, the interaction with photons with electromagnetic field is what most sane people uh, uh, use to search for axiom-like dark matter. It's this E dot B term. And you know, historically, there's just a, a great number of experiments. Uh, and I know a couple that are not even in here yet, um, uh, uh, kind of more recent ideas uh, uh, that search for this. Um, and actually, in my lab, we ran the shaft experiment, which was a kilohertz to megahertz uh, low frequency broadband search. Yes. So may, may I ask? Are, are you talking axion in mass basis, right? Yes. So then, this coupling with GG dual sh should be absent because axion mixes with eta prime, and the un, un, we are this GG dual only cups eta prime, so axion should be decoupled. Right, so so the the axis that you're talking about the strong solving the strong CP yeah, exactly. getting rid of the permanent electron yeah. dipole moment of the new yeah. right? But so of course there's a if if axion's a dark matter if, if axion is is the dark matter then this there's this background axion field that oscillates in time, mm -hmm. right? And so when this when you plug this into this uh, interaction here, there's now an oscillating electric dipole moment. Right, so the mean value is zero, but there's now oscillations around the zero mean value. Sure, but then you are not in mass basis. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by the mass basis. So, whenever you, you have, let's say, axion and eta prime. And what? Eta prime. Eta prime. Eta prime. Right. Right. Yeah. And whenever you diagonalize, only eta prime, so are the anomalous coupling with GG dual. Right. But axion this... is the cup. Right. Axion then couples like ninth boson, like nine, ninth one boson, right? Then this oscillation happens in that direction. Right? So if you want to excite, let, let's say, effectively theta parameter, you should excite eta. So, on, or in other words, you should excite axion in kinetic base, not in mass base. That's why I'm asking, are you using mass basis or kinetic base? So, I, I mean, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not sure. Okay, so this is, I'm not sure what the answer to your question is. I don't know. But, but this is, what I'm saying is that this is an observable effect. So if you had a neutron, for example, and if you had this axiom like dark matter field, then the neutron would acquire an oscillating uh, electric dipole. Right, so shouldn't depend on the basis. That I'm in, right? Sure, but it depends what field you are exciting. That's what I'm asking. What field? So, so yeah. I'm just talking about. You are, you are talking about the axion, which is in, let's say, mass basis, or you are talking about Peche Quinn Goldstein. That, that's a two different things. I'm talking about the latter, Peche Quinn Goldstein. Okay, so you are partially exciting, let's say, at eta prime. Sure. Sure. Okay, I see. Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, so, but again, this is, I, I mean, to me, uh, what matters here is this point that, that a neutron would acquire an oscillating electric dipole moment. And if we agree on this in presence, if we agree on this, then we can move on. Okay. We shouldn't uh, depend on the basis. You are telling me that you are, you are seeking for H.A. Queen excitations, yes. not, let's say, axion mass basis, then, then okay, that's fine. Great. All right. So this is what I'm going to focus on. This actually is, is the main uh, purpose here. Um, and so, as I said, this, this physically, this shows up is if you take a neutron, right, then uh, it, it'll, it'll have an, an oscillating electric dipole moment. And um, 
probably people have seen these kinds of plots before where there's an unknown axion mass on the x-axis and an axion coupling strength on the y-axis. There's a very, very broad range of possibilities here. And there's a red line, which is a QCD axion. That's the actual axion that solves the strong CP problem. Um, uh, so for, for this, the mass is connected to the coupling strength. Uh, and if I were to focus on this interaction and ask the question, well, what kind of magnitude of this oscillating uh, neutron electric dipole moment would correspond to this red line over here, the answer would be 10 to the minus 34 E centimeters, right? So, so uh, E is the charge of the electron, centimeter is the unit of length, so that's the unit of dipole, the unit of dipole moment. And that's oscillating at this uh, uh, frequency, Compton frequency. It's a pretty small number. How small is it? Let's figure it out. So let's then, uh, the interaction of this electric dipole moment with some electric field, let's quantify it by a Rabi frequency. Let's just say that this interaction energy is h bar times some kind of a Rabi frequency and uh, uh, electric field, let's just set it, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain why in a few minutes, let's just set it to about 300 kilovolts per centimeter. Then um, if you plug in this number, then, then you, this corresponds to Rabi frequency of about 10 to the minus 13 radians per second. Um, that's how fast this neutron uh, kind of uh, starts to process. Any idea how long uh, uh, it takes for the neutron to do a pi flip at this frequency? Does anybody, uh, can anyone guess? There's, there's theorists in the audience, you guys should be able to calculate this very rapidly. Until five years? A million years, exactly. Yeah, that's a rapid flop every million years. That's, that's how small this number is. So it takes a million years for the neutron to flip. Uh, okay. Great. So uh, this is this is the, my interaction Hamiltonian, and then again I'll plug in this oscillating uh, uh, axial-like field. So if I look at a, a, any a spin a half, for example, a neutron, and if I look at its energy states, what will happen uh, uh, because this is oscillating in time is these energy uh, states they they are they they kind of um, the, uh, they also uh, go up and down. The, the splitting varies with time. Right, And so what that means is I can essentially write down this interaction as some kind of an effective magnetic field that oscillates uh, at this frequency omega A interacting with the spin, right? Because the magnetic field, oscillating magnetic field would do exactly the same thing. So what I'm saying here is that this is not a real magnetic field. It's not sourced by currents, right? It doesn't obey Maxwell's equations. What I'm saying is, is it to this nuclear spin I or neutron or something like this, this interaction appears like uh, as if it's a magnetic field because it's there, it's it's just varying uh, its energy states. So that's why I call it an effective magnetic field. So basically, to a spin, axion-like dark matter looks like a pseudo magnetic field. That's the point of this slide. Uh, and so uh, that's gamma the usual dark magnetic field. Yeah. So this gamma I'm just putting in there so that. Uh, I mean, I, it's just, a, I can put anything else in there. It's just, it will only affect the, the magnitude of this magnetic field, right? I just want to normalize it so that this is actually kind of, this is what you would write down for a real magnetic field, right? You would make, uh, this is a giant magnetic ratio. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's, that's what we search for. So uh, our CASPER program consists of two experiments at Boston University. We have Casper Electric, which uses spins and salt, nuclear spins and solids. And these experiments are sensitive both to the, this electric dipole moment coupling and the gradients coupling. Um, and our colleagues at Mainz um, uh, and Dima Butker's group, they used hyperpolarized liquids to search for the gradient interaction. Uh, and we are, of course, uh, supported by uh, some theory colleagues. These are the people that are doing the work. These are the people that are doing the talking. So uh, you should really kind of, uh, I'd like to acknowledge these bottom, the people in the bottom left. They're the, they're the real people driving this, this work. Uh, and of course, our uh, 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 funders. What happened to Casper Wind? What happened? To the name Casper Wind. Oh, yes, because, well, we decided that wind is not completely accurate, actually, for reasons that we can discuss if, you, if you're curious, but we decided that gradient is, is a more accurate, because you can have a gradient without having a wind, right? Uh, so, so that's hence the renaming of the, uh, yeah. 
Um, so, right, so, so, so the way we search for this is magnetic resonance. And so very quickly, I wanted to kind of uh, go through this, uh, through how magnetic resonance works. Who here has been in an MRI machine? Ooh, okay, a few people. Apparently, every year, 10% uh, uh, of all people above 50 uh, or, or, six, or 60 or something go into an MRI machine. It's, it's something, um, it's a large percentage. So you probably will be inside an MRI machine at some point in your life. Think of this, think of Casper when, when you are. Um, okay, so, uh, right, so no dark matter on this slide. Uh, basically, just normal um, Zeeman interaction here, a, a real magnetic field interacting with a nuclear spin. Gamma I here is a nuclear giant magnetic ratio. And in an NMR experiment, what you would have is you would have, let's see if I can get rid of this. Can I get rid of this? Maybe, maybe not. I think it's stuck on the screen because of the Zoom setup. I don't actually know how to get rid of that. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's probably, probably no way to get rid of that. All right, well, hopefully, anyway, it doesn't matter. I'll just talk. Right, so in an NMR experiment, you would apply a constant bias magnetic field V0 and a radio frequency field V1 cosine omega T. Those are the two ingredients you need for magnetic resonance. So when you do that, you get your split, your Hamiltonian into two terms. Here is your constant bias magnetic field. Here is your radio frequency field V1. Um, and then you take a single spin half, you place it in this external magnetic field, V0, and what that does is that splits the spin states into spin up and spin down. They're separated by uh, gamma I V0. And now uh, what that corresponds to, if you're in an MRI machine, you don't have a single spin, you have a bunch of spins in your knee or your shoulder or somewhere where you want to image. Uh, and so that, that corresponds to a magnetization of your sample, which points along the magnetic field. Um, and now, uh, when the RF field is on resonance with the spin splitting, uh, uh, with the size of the with, the, with the energy of the spin splitting, then uh, the, this RF field V1 cosine omega zero T can flip the spins. What that corresponds to is you uh, tilt the magnetization. Magnetization undergoes more precession, and there is a uh, a detector that's coupled to the sample. Which, process, which picks up this precession just via Faraday induction. Um, and now this, the spectrum that's, that's if, you, if you take a look at the spectrum of this detector, there'll be a peak at the Lamore frequency, which is gamma I times P zero. Uh, so this is just, this is a very standard, well understood tool for non-invasive imaging, spectroscopy and so on, uh, nuclear. So people have known about this for many, many decades. Okay, now, what do we have in Casper? In Casper, we have exactly the same thing, but now we have this effective interaction of a nuclear spin with a pseudo-magnetic field that I talked about a couple of minutes ago. Uh, so now in Casper, we have a constant bias magnetic field B0, but now we don't apply this radio frequency field. We let this effective interaction play the role of the RF field. That's the difference. So, so the bias magnetic field B0 splits our spin states into spin up and spin down. Um, what this corresponds to is we, we, we magnetize our sample a little bit. And now if we get extremely lucky, and this frequency omega A over here, that's the axion Compton frequency, just matches the spin uh, flip transition. What that means is this term, this effective interaction, can now drive these spin flip transitions. The, the sample magnetization tilts and processes. We have a, um, a detector that's coupled to our sample. And so if we look at, at the signal spectrum, then a peak will pop up at exactly this frequency, omega A. And that's what we search for. Of course, we don't know what omega A is. So what that means is we have to scan this B0. We have to change the current in our magnet so, uh, and, and probe different frequencies by, by changing B0. So basically, the gist is, is CASPER is an NMR experiment with no RF magnetic field. Instead, it's this axial-like dark matter that flips the space. How small is B1 in the standard NMR? Uh, so standard NMR, they, you want to make B1 as large as possible, basically. So typically, the, the game in NMR is you want to flip the spins before they decohere. So in a solid, for example, the decoherence time would be on the order of 100 mic 10 to 100 microseconds. So what that means is your B1 needs to be kind of 10 gauss, 100 gauss. They actually use huge kilowatt amplifiers to be able to whack the spins as quickly as possible. 
And I don't know if you know this, but in an MRI, you, have you been in an MRI? It takes a while. An MRI takes a while. It takes like 20, 30 minutes. You know why? You know why? Because it's actually limited by the size of B1 because uh, every, every kind of slice, they, they, they image different slices of brain or, or, or tissue or something like this. And every slice you have to flip, the, you have to change the magnetic field gradient and then flip a bunch of spins. So you have to apply this B1. And, and after you flip the spins, you obviously change the energy of the spins, right? Where does that energy go? It goes into heat sooner or later, right? And they can't do that too quickly because they'll literally cook the patient if they do it too rapidly. So the time that you spend in an MRI, they could image you in a minute, but they would cook you, right? So you don't want that. Like it's a microwave, basically, right? They would cook you from the inside. So that's why it takes 20 um, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's also the B1 in the axon case. It's just yes. Oh, excellent. Thank you for pointing. Yeah. So this leads me uh, exactly. So Kieran, oh, yeah. I gave me a perfect se segue. So one thing, right? That's one point I want to make here is because we're changing this B0, we're not changing the cavity size, uh, right? We're, we're all we're doing is changing the current in the magnet. And so what that means is we actually we can. Uh, uh, we, we can do that um, in a very, very broad range of, freak of, of, of currents and, and magnetic fields. We're limited up to, at the top by about kind of 10 Tesla, that's how high a magnet we can get. Uh, but, but we can basically, using this approach, we can probe frequencies from microhertz to about gigahertz. Um, and our sensitivity can be optimized by choices, which I'll get to in a minute. But again, our ultimate goal is over here. What does that mean? Well, this B1 star effective magnetic field for a QCD axion is in the order of 10 to minus 20 Tesla, right? So that's how small um, an oscillating effective field we have to uh, detect. Um, I already talked about the Rabi frequency, which is gamma I times B1 star. That's on the order of 10 to minus 13 radians per second. The tilting angle of this magnetization uh, is just the Rabi frequency times the decoherence time of the spins. It's about 10 to minus 15 radians. That's what we would have to measure to get to this red line. This is our kind of holy grail. That's the goal. So now that I kind of mentioned some numbers that might look a little daunting, let me explain how, what we've done to, uh, uh, to kind of approach this red line. Okay, uh, right. So number one is we, if we want to get this small, we better make sure that all the outside magnetic fields are suppressed below this level, or, or at least below some, some very low level. Uh, and actually, so this is a plug for our shaft experiment, where we, um, uh, which was basically a sandbox experiment to exactly to make sure that we can uh, suppress the fields kind of down to and, and be sensitive to these kinds of fields. Um, this made you this this was actually searching for the electromagnetic interaction of, of axial-like dark matter, but we used um, a Meissner effect in a two-layer superconducting magnetic shielding. Uh, 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 magnetic shield, and in the end, inside the shield, we we were kind of uh, we had a magnetic field sensitivity of about 100, uh, 100 data tesla per root hertz, and then we averaged for a long time. So our ultimate sensitivity, this this kind of corresponds uh, uh, to this blue line over here. We were ultimately limited by the, the, the sensitivity of our sensor, but but this blue line corresponds to a magnetic field of about two atta tesla. So we're not quite at 10 minus 20 Tesla level, but we, we, you know, we're pretty close. So I'm like, yeah, what's two orders of magnitude, right? Um, so so um, uh, that, that's the first point. Uh, uh, so after that, we kind of decided, all right, this is a nice story, but let's actually run a proof of principle experiment. So we did that using um, this, this ferroelectric material, PMNPT, just a small sample of it. Uh, it's shown over here. The reason we use ferroelectrics uh, is, is precisely because of this off-centering of the lead ion in the, in the lattice. And this is what gives us this effective electric field E star that the neutron EDM that it interacts with, about 340 kilovolts per centimeter. This is a ferroelectric hysteresis loop. By applying a voltage, we can actually move these atoms up and down. Um, the physics here, have people heard about the thorium oxide uh, electron EDM experiments? Uh, okay. 
Um, well, uh, so, so the physics here is similar to a polar molecule. Uh, so you can basically think of a ferroelectrics as a bunch of a, pol a bunch of polar molecules jammed into the solid. Um, and the physics is exactly the same. It's kind of well known um, from, from uh, AMO experiments searching for electron ED. Um, okay, so we, this is the material we work with. The, our sensor was either a squid, a superconducting point of interference device, or just a low noise amplifier. This is an X-ray of our experiments. This is a sample. This is a, a pickup coil is in blue. Then we also have an excitation coil. So it's just to make sure that our experiment is actually sensitive to something. The best way not to find dark matter is not to I always tell my students. So you have to make sure to calibrate your experiment that your experiment is actually can, can see the spin. So maybe the sample fell out, something like this, right? Then you'll obviously measure nothing. Um, so, so that's why we use the excitation coils is we actually, we occasionally tilt the spins on purpose. We actually do an MR uh, and then pick up the processing magnetization. But of course, for the axion search uh, data, we switch off the excitation coils here. Um, and this is what the experiment looks like. And so using this kind of millimeter scale experiments, we got some results which were, uh, um, uh, uh, which were published over here. And we've got a couple of uh, exclusion plots that, that on this scale don't look very broad, but actually kind of about an octave uh, in frequency or almost, maybe not quite an octave, maybe kind of, uh, um, maybe 20% tw you know, thereabouts in frequency space. But, but so these are the two results we've got. And then in principle, uh, th this, this um, dash green line, this is our estimate that we made before we ran the experiments of how sensitive we would be. So the point here is that our results exactly hit our estimates, so we know what we're doing. That was our conclusion, at least. Alex, can I ask a question? That's the good news. What's that? Can I ask a question, please? You, well, you mentioned the you mentioned the EDM experiments in polar molecules. Yes. Those have eye-wateringly strong effective electric fields. Correct. Um, this does not. Is, Correct. Is, can you just rehearse the hand-waving argument for why the effective electric field in this case is so much weaker? Yes. Than those polar molecule cases? Yes, thank you for pointing that out. Obviously, so, so somebody does know about the polar molecules. So for the polar molecules, the effective uh, what they're searching for is the electric dipole moment of the electron. Uh, uh, so the physics there is similar, but a little bit different. Um, so for them, the effective electric fields are on the order of gigavolts per centimeter, uh, several gigavolts per centimeter. So here, the physics here is, is a little bit different. This is the electric dipole moment of a nucleus rather than the electron. So uh, the, the principle is the same, but the fact that the nucleus is so much smaller than the atom itself, that's, that's, that's basically what gives rise to this suppression compared to the electron EDM, um, uh, effective electric field. So, so it's basically the size issue uh, uh, combined with the shift theorem. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Uh, is perhaps, a... perhaps not entirely. I mean the. I mean those measurements take place inside a polar molecule. Yes. Uh, you've got a. You've got lead displaced within. Uh, you know, within a particular crystal lattice, the order of magnitude of the spacings is the same. Correct. Uh, so, but again, there are... I, I believe I believe the estimates. So the, the question is just what's what's the hand? I, I understand that you don't need as strong an electric field as they do in the polar molecule cases. Just what's the origin? Right. So we would love a stronger electric field. Again, yes. the difference is that the electron wave function is on the order of a molecular. So the size of the electron wave function is on the order of the molecule size. So, so it's uh, angstrom is a typical length scale for the electron wave function. We're not looking at electrons. We're looking at nuclei. Right? It's a nucleus. 
we were looking at the nuclear spin, like the nuke and the size of the nucleus is much less, right? So it's no, not no, that, that that part I got. I so I, I understand how you can get away with a weaker electric field. I'm still not quite getting why on a simple hand wave why the electric field is so much weaker. So it's not a real okay, good. So it's not a it's not a real electric field. Again, this is one of these fake electric fields. It's not an electric field that's sourced by a charge. It's it's a term. So if I may go back, it's this term here. Uh, let me go back here to where it's actually written down. So maybe over here. So the, this electric field, you can't see my cursor, obviously, but in the top line, um, there's an electric field, dne star dot i. So it's, a, it's an effective electric field. That, that appears in this interaction. Okay, fine, fine. That 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 explains it. So in the polar molecule case, it's it's actually a relativistic effect because yes. of of kind of subtle origin because right. just from an electrostatic point of view, an electron That's right. between the two centers isn't isn't at equilibrium because of relativistic effects. And Okay, so this is a completely different thing at that level. Right. So, but again, it comes down because you asked for a hand, hand wavy argument. Yes, I did. It is a relativistic effect for the electrons. And here it's a, basically the effect is due to finite nuclear size. Okay, that, uh, that establishes the hand wave. Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. Um, Can I ask about this material as well? So, this, yeah. this E star, is this purely a property of the material or is it? down to the preparation yeah it basically comes down to how far is the lead atom displaced from the center of symmetry so it's proportional to that so the uh here in this case it's the the, the actual number the physical displacement is about 0 0.3 0 0.2 angstroms um this typical size of this unit cell is a couple of angst about three angstroms of anything basically so it's about a about a 10 20 percent effect here and that corresponds to this 340 kilovolts per centimeter. That's and there's a bunch of other things that go in there, such as the the, the atomic number here of the lead and so on. Um, yeah, it's a it's a great question. It's a somewhat complicated answer, unfortunately. And then, do these individual atoms have are these like lopsided, lumpy yes. atoms themselves? As well? Absolutely. Yeah. So to calculate this carefully, one needs to do. One needs to know the electron wave functions in here and how they overlap with the nuclei and so on. Um, okay, great. So, so now, I mean, what actually what I wanted to talk to you about. So, so okay, we kind of we uh, the point here of this slide is to say, all right. So, so we've got some experiments, but the no, uh, the good news I was giving you is that look, they're on top of the line that we predicted. The bad news is they're nowhere close to where we want to be, right? So, the obvious next question is, well, why not? Why aren't we down here? So why, what actually did limit us to, to, to this kind of sensitivity? And how do we plan to get down here, which is what we want to do. That's the good stuff is down here, not up here. Okay, so what is, uh, and, and by the way, here I apologize to the theorists of the audience uh, because I will now talk about experimental stuff. However, chances are you have taught this stuff in a very recent few, uh, past. So you should be, everyone in this room uh, should be able to, uh, relate to what I'm going to talk about because it's going to be circuits. Uh, uh, so, so basically, this is a little uh, toy circuit schematic diagram of our experiment. So here is our spin ensemble, and there's this rotating magnetization and perpendicular uh, component, right? And that inductively couples to a coil, which essentially is an inductor in our circuit. And now the way we couple it to our squid is we complete the circuit here. It's, it becomes a superconducting circuit. And um, the signal here, right, it's a Faraday induction. So Faraday induction is a voltage, right, across the, the uh, in, in, in series with the inductor. What the squid sees, though, it's not a voltage, it's a current because it's inductively coupled and the squid is basically a current measurement device. So uh, what is this voltage source? Well, uh, here we go. So Faraday induction, right, tells us one of the Maxwell's equations says that the voltage here that's induced by this processing magnetization uh, is uh, minus n d phi by dt, where phi is the magnetic flux through this inductor. Uh, so it's just b 
B times A, uh, uh, B is the magnetic field through the inductor, and, and N is the number of turns, and this, this time derivative just turns into an omega. Everyone okay with this? Excellent. So that's the voltage source. However, the squid measures the current, so we have to turn this voltage into a current. And the way we do this is we have to divide it by the total impedance in the circuit, because we mostly have, this is a superconducting circuit made of, uh, we're at four Kelvin, this is made of niobium wire. Uh, so the dominant impedance is the inductive impedance, I omega L. Uh, and so you divide by that. And so, and, and now what this means is that the squid noise limits the sensitivity with which we can measure this current. And therefore, kind of the squid noise can, can be thought of as current noise. And therefore, using this equation here, we can refer it to the magnetic field noise. And this is what limits our sensitivity, which is to say that if somebody gave us a squid that was 100 times more sensitive to current, our limits would immediately be 100 times better. That makes sense, right? It's the, basically this, this device here it has some intrinsic sensitivity. The better it is, the better our limits. So this is our limiting resources, squid performance. So the immediate question is, how do we do better? Those of you have, who have taught uh, circuits recently, can you guess how to do better? Given what I just told you. Is there a way to, to basically, given a certain voltage, to increase the current that, that's fly, flowing in the circuit? Low, low, yes, good, excellent. Exactly, lower the inductance. However, if you, how do you do that? You either have fewer turns or have smaller area. But look, your voltage is proportional to turns and area. So you can't lower the inductance. There's actually an optimal inductance, which, you know, uh, which kind of matches this inductance and so on. But, but there's only so far you can lower it, basically. But you can actually do better. Is there a way to, how do you increase this current given a constant voltage without lowering the inductance? Lower the frequency. Lower the, yeah, but then you lower the voltage as well, you, right? So it's so not quite, you can change the circuit. You can add things to the circuit. You are allowed to do that. What would you add to the circuit? How do you decrease the impedance, the total impedance of the circuit? You thought this was just going to be a journal club, didn't you? <laughs> this is a test. You have taught this very recently, trust me. This is a first year physics uh, question for first year physics students. Add another parallel uh, inductor? Uh, well, parallel, you would just change this inductor. Uh, but is there another circuit element you could add to the circuit? Is that a resistor? A resistor, yes, but a resistor would only increase this, right? Uh, the, the total impedance. Is there another circuit element you could add to this? <laughs> a capacitor. <laughs> exactly, because a capacitor, what is a capacitor? Let's add a capacitor. What does that do? I'll, I also added a little resistor, which I'll talk to in a minute. But what does a capacitor do? So if I build this circuit here, what does that do? Well, look. Everybody knows the impedance of an LRC circuit. So when you're in resonant, the, the capacitive impedance cancels the inductive impedance. And therefore, on resonance, the total impedance of the circuit is just the resistor over here. And for a superconducting circuit, that could be tiny. So now, uh, so this is an LRC circuit. Does everybody remember? This is the formula I, I remember from my first year. Uh, so the one over square root of uh, LC, right, is the resonant uh, frequency. And the quality factor is omega uh, L over R. Everybody remember this, right? So if you substitute that in, you could see that compared to this, we just enhanced our current by a factor of Q, where Q is the quality factor of this circuit. Now, this resistance, the quality factor cannot be infinite. Even for a superconducting circuit, there's inevitably going to be some dissipation. Which, which I'm encoding in this resistance, which, which limits the quality factor. Uh, and we can talk about what the physics of that is, but, uh, but, but there's always gonna be some dissipation. You can't avoid it, right? So is everyone okay with basically adding a, a capacitor here? You are now canceling, right? So remember the phasor diagrams, how you have the inductive phasor and the 
and the, the capacitive phase are they cancel out? No, no, you don't, you don't do that in LRC circuits. Okay, never mind. Theorists. <laughs> anyway, so, but, but this, hopefully this rings a bell. Uh, and, and the point is, yeah, the dominant impedance is, is, inductance, is inductive, you're canceling that with the capacitor and you're only left with the resistor. So with the resonance circuit now, the squid on resonance can detect a factor of Q larger current for a given voltage. So basically, if I just make a big enough uh, Q, a circuit with a big enough Q, I can enhance my current as much as I want to. Does that mean that my sensitivity can get as good as it can be? What now limits? What is the dominant source of noise in the circuit? Suppose I, I have a completely noiseless squid effectively, right? Because I enhance this current in the circuit as much as I want. What is now another source of noise which will start limiting me? Heisenberg principle. Uh, yes, Heisenberg at some point. But first, even before that, actually, there's something else that will start limiting me. So here, I, I mean, theorists probably wouldn't, wouldn't uh, well, experimentalists should know this very well. Because at finite temperature, any resistor generates something called the Johnson Nyquist thermal noise, right? Uh, and, and, and basically, it's, uh, the, the, the noise spectral density is proportional to KT, the RKT, right? Uh, the people remember this uh, vaguely, right? So, so, so there's a little, a resistor always comes with a little noise voltage source. Um, uh, and so what that means is that, that 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 voltage source adds to to this voltage source over here? So and that actually uh, at finite temperature. So this is not quantum. This is completely classical. This is thermal noise. And so realistically, this is first what what starts limiting us, especially at low frequencies. It's the circuit temperature and quality factor. So um, as, so what that means is if if one was, wants to build a resonant circuit like that, one should really cool down the circuit as much as possible. So this is why we. Uh, built our experiment in a dilution fridge and cool it to millikelvin temperature, as does everybody else, right? This, this is the reason. Okay, so let me tell you what this looks like. Let me actually show you some measurements. So here is uh, a noise spectrum for a circuit that we've built that looks exactly like this with a resonant frequency of about 2.3 megahertz or thereabouts. So it's a reasonable inductor of about 20 or 30 turns and a capacitor that you could basically just make um, arts and crafts style. Uh, and, and then when you, when you look at the, 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 the current here, um, the, the squid sees, you could see um, there's, a, there's a baseline, and the baseline is the squid noise, the, the, the current noise of the squid. But on resonance, um, there is a peak, and this peak is what corresponds to this, uh, um, uh, to, to this thermal noise generated by this resistor. This is this thermal noise. And I can prove that to you because we can change the temperature of our fridge and we can plot this noise power as a function of temperature. And as predicted, that should be linear in temperature. So here is the line over here. Uh, so this is our thermal noise and the quality factor. I don't know if you could do this in your head or not, but uh, the line width here or the, the frequency divided by the line width is about 30,000. This is a quality factor that we've been able to achieve. And the noise temperature, in this case, more or less defined as how much noise, even if we were able to cool down our fridge to absolute zero, how much noise would show up here? That's the noise temperature. It happens to be about 100 millikelvin or thereabouts. Does this make sense? And, and again, I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to talk explicitly about why this and why this. If you're interested, ask me afterwards. Uh, these are experimental, dirty experimentalist details. Now, the question is, can we do even better? What, what, what would happen if we were able to bring this down to absolute zero somehow? So eliminate the source of noise altogether. Um, well, uh, uh, let's see. So we achieved a, a 30,000 and 100 millikelvin. What if we had a completely noiseless, like this, all of this were completely noiseless. So, so really the noise temperature were, um, uh, the, of the circuit were completely zero. What would then be limiting us? Yes. With the sensitivities that you were showing before on the graph, was that when you're in the squid noise limited case? Yes. Or yes. yes. Yeah, good. I'll, I'll, I'll show you the Nyquist in a minute. Yeah, it'll be better. Uh, right. So now, but, but the question is what happens if this were completely noiseless? 
Well, someone said Heisenberg principle, right? So this is the, uh, what's, the what's the noise that's created by the spin ensemble intrinsically? That's always going to be there. Even if we had the perfect circuit, the perfect fridge here, there's always going to be some noise generated by the spin ensemble. So uh, what would that be? Okay, and this is called the quantum spin projection, by the way. Uh, so here we go, another quiz for you. Uh, 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 uh. You didn't know you were signing up for this, but here we go. So let's take a single spin one half, uh, and we'll put it in a magnetic field uh, so that the spin levels are split into spin up and spin down, and we initialize the spin into a spin up state. So all the population is over here in a spin up state. It's really pointing spin up. And then we have a completely noiseless detection circuit that measures the Y projection of the spin. What can I get? What uh, results can I get if I make a projective measurement of the Y projection of the spin? Spin one half. What are the answer? What, what's the answer I can get? Simple question, not tricky. Plus one half or minus one. Perfect. That's exactly right. Plus a half or minus a half. So I, I cannot get zero. That's the point, right? Quantum mechanics says I will never get zero. Is everyone okay with that for a spin a half? Okay, great. So what that means is if I repeat this experiment n times or I do it on n independent spins, which is the same thing, I will get something that looks like this. On average, I will get zero. But there'll be a spread, and the width of this distribution will be about square root of the number of measurements that I did. Is this okay with everybody? So I get each time I get plus a half, minus a half, it'll average to zero because it's pointing in the z direction, but there'll be some spread. And this spread is what's known as a spin projection noise, right? So what that means is that each time you do it, you're likely to get some uh, y component. And so if I now look at the, the spectrum that's detected by my noiseless detection circuit, there's going to be a peak that pops up. The magnitude of this peak will be proportional to the square root of the number of spins in my sample um, and the magnetic moment of each spin. And to give you an idea for how much that would be, it's about a femtotesla per root hertz for uh, about a centimeter, uh, a cubic centimeter of, of water for protons and a cubic centimeter of water. This has been measured before. This is, this is well known uh, and predicted, predicted by Bloch, I think, in the 50s. Um, and actually, since, since I brought this up, uh, this now leads me to something called the standard uh, uh, quantum limit for spins, because now if I were to use this experiment to look for a new fundamental interaction, like axiom dark matter, for example, and I were to quantify it like this with a Rabi frequency, I would say, look, my signal, which, which if the spins were tilted, would be some, some transverse magnetization, is the number of spins times the angle, which is the Rabi frequency times the coherence time. But my noise in each decoherence time is square root of the number of spins. So to get an SNR of one, my signal is on the left-hand side, is the noise divided by the square root of the number of measurements I can take, which is total measurement of a square root of the total measurement time divided by the decoherence time. And if I were to rearrange this and just get what's, what's the smallest omega one I can measure, with an SNR of one, it corresponds to this formula, and this is known as a standard quantum limit for magnetic resonance. This is the quantum mechanics in, imposes the limit on the sensitivity of a magnetic resonance experiment. Does this make sense? So this is given some time t to measure, some decoherence time t2 of these spins, and, and spins, this is how well one can do. That's what quantum mechanics says just comes from the spin projection. Uh, okay, so then, um, then let's see what this means for us experimentally. So if I were to actually measure this, uh, the voltage here, right, I would see, of course, at finite temperature, I would see my Johnson noise in this resistor. That's this VC term that I've already talked about. Uh, and this is flat in frequency, right? It doesn't depend on, on, upon frequency in this, in this kind of voltage representation. But then in presence of this spin projection noise, I have to add another term to this. And what this term looks like is something very, very ugly. You don't have to worry about exactly what the letters here are. Um, the details are in this paper. The important thing to notice from this expression is that it's peaked. This red line over here is, is maximum exactly at the spin Lamour frequency. It shouldn't be 
a surprise, right? Because again, I'm just on the previous slide, I said, look, there's a peak over here in the noise. This peak is exactly this red peak over here, right? So, so the denominator here is minimized on uh, uh, when omega is equal to omega s, the, the magnetic frequency. So the total noise is the sum of the blue and the red. That's this green over here. And the condition for an experiment that's limited by spin projection noise in this ensemble and not by the noise in the detector is that on resonance, the, the red line is above the blue. In other words, the, this V circuit, this first term is less than the second term when it's on resonance. And you can rearrange, it's easy to see, the details are in this paper over here, that this corresponds to this, the, the noise temperature of the circuit being below 100 millikelvin and its quality factor being above 30,000. And for those of you who are paying attention, uh, you may remember that this is exactly the performance that I told you about a few slides ago. So that's the point, is that now our circuit has achieved that performance. Um, and so now with that in mind, uh, I want to conclude, uh, and you know, uh, uh, this is kind of the main punchline of what I wanted to talk to you about. There are ways to do better than this, but uh, again, if you want to know, then ask me. Uh, I have a couple of backup slides. Uh, but the point, uh, I promised you quantum limits of precision magnetic resonance. So basically, this is the standard quantum limit over here on omega-1 that I talked about. And of course, um, a number of experiments uh, are subject to this limit. Atomic clocks, EDM searches, searches for ultralight dark matter, and so on. Here's a little table that kind of puts together some uh, different experiments that uh, they kind of search for this kind of omega-1 uh, or, 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 or measure this kind of omega-1 Rabi frequency. Some atomic clocks, they're typically sensitive to millihertz omega-1s. Um, the record, uh, I think was, uh, was hold, is held by the Mercury 199 EDM search. They're sensitive to omega-1 on the order of 10 nanohertz. Um, and, uh, and of course, like I said, there are in principle uh, some caveats to this standard quantum limit. Um, there's ways to go beyond the standard quantum limit using squeezing. Um, there's, there's ideas for how to decouple interactions and get longer T2s and a completely different scaling um, can be had with some levitated ferromagnets. This is our paper from a few years ago that talks about that. However, um, if you just look at this, you will quickly realize that the opportunity is that if n is very large, I can get very small omega ones. I just need a lot of n. And so what that means is that in solid state and liquid state and MR, you could have n's of 10 to the 22 and 10 to the 21, right? That's how many atoms you can have in a solid. So what that would correspond to is omega ones of picohertz at picohertz level. And that's what we're chasing over here, is small omega ones there. Um, that's the opportunity. The challenge is we have to con control other noise sources. We have to achieve quantum limited readout and we have to polarize and control lots of qubits. However, we've kind of, I talked about how we, are, we achieved at least these two, these first two. Um, and now that we've done that, what we're doing is we're building an experiment which is resonant. So it will be a very narrow band experiment. But now our science goal is to build an experiment that can touch this QCD axiom line in the near term. Um, and uh, maybe in the longer term, something that can scan um, a very, very broad range here of frequencies and search for QCD axiom dark matter in this broad range of masses. Um, so that's it for now. Uh, I'm done. Thank you for coming. Other questions? Can I ask about the um, these squeeze states? Because this is the squeeze states when you need to like pass off the this quantum limited uncertainty into some other mm -hmm. variable that you, you don't care about. What are the two variables in this? Yeah, good. So thank you for uh, for kind of um, for asking about this. Let me talk about that. Right. So. Um, this is my backup slide, so it's as if I, uh, if we colluded, right? So, uh, right. So, so here is the little distribution that I talked about. This is the spin projection noise, uh, right? This is the Gaussian you would get if you repeated this, ex this experiment that I talked about n times. What squeezing corresponds to is attempting, oh, actually, before I do that, if you look 
if you look at this situation from above, so from above the z-axis, you're standing there looking from uh, at the spin from above the z-axis. What this corresponds to, you can draw this as a little circle, which corresponds to the uncertainty of the spin ensemble um, in the xy uh, or the magnetization in the xy plane. Right, so you could see that this noise is going to be roughly square root of n. Is, is everyone seeing what this what this is about? So, so x and y, of course, is symmetric in this case. Uh, so, what one could do, uh, well, here the signal would be a displacement in one of these quadratures, and then the SQL uh, basically says that that omega one is proportional to one over root n, and so the limiting resource is the number of spins. So, there's two ways to improve sensitivity. One is to get a larger n. And the second, as Kieran pointed out, is to squeeze. What does squeezing mean? Squeezing means you do something fancy. And again, we can, if you're curious, I can talk about what that is. Uh, but you basically, you're allowed to squeeze one of the quadratures of the spins at the price of, uh, of anti-squeezing the other quadrature. The total area of the circuit has to stay the same by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Uh, uh, and there's some squeezing. So you, you're allowed to do that by some, using some squeezing parameter. What that corresponds to is in this quadrature, you now get a narrower Gauss, provided you only measure that quadrature. So if your signal is along that quadrature, then using squeezing, you would say that uh, now my omega one is C of a root n, where C is some squeezing parameter less than one. So if a signal phase is known, the squeezing can improve sensitivity beyond the standard quantum level. And I think this is what Kieran is saying. Right, is that you are improving in one quadrature at the price of, of being worse in the other quadrature. However, of course, um, if you don't know the quadrature, right? So in this direction, you got worse. So, so if you don't know which quadrature you're measuring, then you, you, don't, you don't actually win in the end. Um, the, the one way one could win is to actually look at the anti-squeezing quadrature. Right, and we're writing a paper on this right now, actually. So if you look at the anti-squeezing quadrature, you might think, well, actually, I lost, right? Because my noise is bigger uh, by, by this squeezing, by one over the squeezing parameter, C. Um, however, what the but your signal is actually also bigger. You see the signal also in is enhanced by the, same, uh, and, uh, by the same squeezing parameter. So what that means is that, well, look, as far as the standard quantum limit, you don't win or you don't, and you don't lose, right? You stay the same. It's still delta M over M is still one over root N. But now if you have other sources of noise in your experiment, because your signal got increased, now the, the, the other noise becomes less important. Does that make sense? So if the signal phase is unknown, actually anti-squeezing can make it easier to achieve this one over root N system. Um, so I don't know. Did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah what, so, what do you have to change to the, the measurement? So you, do you now have to measure more more things because you, you're talking about measuring magnetization in both? Yeah. So so basically, the way you squeeze is you know which quadrature you're squeezing. You can control which quadrature you're squeezing or not squeezing. So it's just a question of or anti-squeezing, squeezing or anti-squeezing. So it's just a question of which quadrature you measure in the end. I'm saying that's actually, you shouldn't measure this quadrature. You should measure this quadrature. Someone counterintuitive. Thank you for asking. You got a question? I'm uh, gonna be on the screen. Uh, okay. Yeah. I have something much more practical. Um, I, like in the lab, it's hard enough not to get any random noise pickup. How do you um, mitigate against that? Like, are you in a special kind of like, low noise environment this is like a faraday cage you'll have yeah, you're an experimentalist <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh yes um and actually i mean the data that i showed here um so maybe let me just uh, uh go back here so yeah, so so this this looks nice right i th there are it, there are other kind of pick up lines. If you look far enough away outside of bandwidth, there's always pick up lines out there. Um, however, actually somewhat surprisingly, this stuff is not even that well shielded. There is some magnetic shielding around, meaning because you're superconducting shielding, but uh, but it's not too bad. What we mostly have to worry about is just, just electrostatic, like what you're talking about, uh, mostly capacitive coupling of just junk going down uh, all of the wires 
kind of coax cables. So it's it's a matter of designing the wiring um, uh, uh, kind of in a, in a correct way and lots of trial and error. But in the end, uh, so I, actually I didn't mention this. I Every time, I, I should probably say that th these data were um, taken uh, in cool down number 56, I think, uh, uh, or, or something like that. We, so we had 50 trials. So we got this uh, uh, fridge about a year and a half ago. So in about a year, uh, a little less than a year and a half ago. So in a year and a half, we had 50 trials uh, or thereabouts of, of this experiment. So what that means is that roughly every week, one, one to two weeks, we would say, oh, we put something together, we give it a go and it just doesn't work. So we just change something and try it. So, so it basically, I think the answer to your question is lots of trial and error and thinking about what does it work. Um, but no, it's not a it's not a Faraday cage. It's just kind of sitting out there in the lab. Uh, it's not even vibrationally isolated. It's just careful design and decoupling. Sorry, right. I wish there was a <laughs> magic bullet, but I, yeah, it's not that I know of. Yeah. Um, okay. um, so with the, we were saying that in theory, you can search this quite large frequency space, but obviously you're like looking on resonance. So assuming you're able to get it to kind of search that whole space, how long would it actually take? Yeah, good question. So it depends, right? So I kind of alluded to this um, at the beginning of my talk, but um, uh, the important question, so you're asking, look, this, this looks okay. You, like you can do this. There's nothing stopping us from doing this. How long does it take to sweep over? I guess this is about uh, kind of four or five decades of frequency, right? It's a great question. Um, so uh, I think the answer depends on um, how uh, uh, is essentially the interplay between the standard quantum limit uh, and, uh, well, okay, so, so maybe let, let me just give you a definite answer. So you can see that if we're limited by this, then the only thing we're limited by really is M. Meaning if I have more N, I can have a more sensitive experiment. That means I can sweep faster because I need to spend less time averaging at every frequency. So the answer to your question depend on what, depends on what N I can get, right? So I think uh, given kind of the currently demonstrated numbers uh, that, that, that I showed you earlier, uh, it would, with, with kind of about a 10 or 20 centimeter sample, it would take something like on the order of a few months to a year uh, to scan over there. A bit, but that's a big sample. We don't want like 20 cents, that's, that's big. Yeah. Uh, that's a big magnet board, right? So what we're, part of one of the things we're working on is trying to be clever about our material choice and uh, what, what is the effective electric field that we can have in our material. If we can get that uh, increased, then with a smaller sample, we could still sweep in a reasonable. So I think we, we never go for something more than about a year or two, just because people like right people lose interest after a couple of years. Um, so if we can touch the QCD axion line, it's just a question of size. Like in the end, the experiment will be of the size that this would take about a year or two. What size of samples are you actually thinking about? So I don't like a chemist, like a chemistry NMR, you're talking about something like. Yeah. that big by that big, right. but tiny. Exactly, yeah. So right now our experiments are four millimeters, experimental uh, samples are four, four millimeters in size, right? And that's, in the end, what dict, I mean, there's a material, right, is, is, is one thing, but the other thing is the magnet bore, because we use a superconducting magnet. So if you want a bigger sample, um, then you need to, to have a bigger magnet. And I think the cost of the magnet scales is volume squared or cubed or something it's a very fast function volume and field. So, um, you know, in the end it's, I mean, of course in the end it's money, but uh, uh, but yeah, right now we're working with millimeter size sounds. There's a question. May, may I have a little comment? Please, yes. Hi, Victor. Okay. Yeah, because there was a discussion of effective field for neutron EDM. It's a little bit misleading because you do not measure Neutron EDM, you measure shift moment, which is not proportional to neutron EDM. Yeah, and so there is a lot of nuclear physics involved in this problem. And uh, am I clear? Yeah, because uh, neutron EDM is unobservable, actually, because of shift theory, because of screening. What um, Alex measures is shift moment, 
shift moment is not proportional to neutron DM, but if you have some model, you, you can recalculate, yes. You can calculate ratio and express the results in terms of neutron DM, but we don't measure neutron DM. So if there's nuclear physics involved in this problem, and a shift moment may be enhanced by three orders of magnitude. And Alex is considering this problem already, some European compounds and so on. Uh, so this is a reason why uh, shift uh, effective field um, for uh, kind of axion part uh, is, has nothing to do with effective field for electron and electric dipole moment because physics is completely different. I would say very different for electron electric dipole moment and uh, this axion search or some theta QCD search, whatever, in uh, uh, Alex experiment. Yeah, Victor, you're, 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 well, Victor says is absolutely correct. And I apologize for sweeping all of that under the rug uh, and, and kind of uh, saying, uh, connecting it to neutron EDM rather than, as you correctly point out, it, sh it is the shift moment and there is a lot of nuclear physics and it is much more complicated than, than what I led on to. Uh, that is absolutely correct. And again, it's the, the way I simplified it was by making it wrong. Uh, and, 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 and you're right, uh, however, it is simpler. Um, but if, so it's, it's not only uh, some solid state factor which works. It means yes. you can play with nuclear physics and get some three orders of big, bigger effect or something like that. That's absolutely right. It's all yes. like, no, two orders of magnitude. Just selecting a proper nucleus. That's right. Uh, of course, there is a lot of physics which I don't understand there. <laughs> How could uh, solid states with European, for example, and so on? Yes. Yeah, but still there is a, another route to go to higher sensitivity. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. You're absolutely right. All right. Well, I'm